In the last five years, Britain has witnessed a disturbing new crime. Young children are being abused and even murdered by parents and relatives. The abusers claim the children are possessed by evil spirits. Adam, Victoria Climbier, and Child B, a roll call of children whose death and torture has sent shockwaves across Britain. Dr. Richard Hoskins was an expert witness in all these cases. All the individuals that were found guilty in these cases were Christians who were worshipping in certain churches. Now the question that arises in my mind, therefore, is how responsibly are the churches preaching about the dangers of belief in that witchcraft? Richard Hoskins is about to embark on a journey to the heart of this disturbing phenomenon. He's in search of a young London child, one of a number who have been sent back to Africa to be exorcised in the name of God. It is a journey that will take him from the streets of Britain to the remote villages of the Congo and face to face with the horrifying realities of exorcism in the 21st century. I hear you here. It's Sunday. The Congolese capital, Kinshasa, is awash with religious fervor. The stadium where Muhammad Ali and George Foreman once fought the rumble in the jungle is now the setting for more spiritual battles. Unlike in Britain, Christianity is growing in popularity. But here, it is mixed with a belief in traditional forces. The most evil forces of all are known as Kindoki. Kindoki, or witchcraft, has always been part of traditional Congolese beliefs. But after being absorbed into Christianity, the dread believers have for this evil power has grown. Now, Kindoki is thought to have the power to actually possess people, especially children, and for these spirits to possess others in turn. It has to be driven out through exorcism, known here as deliverance. You shall call his name Jesus. I hear you here. Dr. Richard Hoskins is senior research fellow in the sociology of religion at King's College London and is a specialist in African belief. He lived in Africa for many years and is an advisor to the police and courts. African communities in the United Kingdom are rightly fearful of an unjust backlash from the sensational reporting of child abuse cases associated with witchcraft. But, on the other hand, we must be vigilant to protect innocent children from appalling abuse. Whatever the in the last two or three years, a number of cases have come to light in Britain now, what I need to find out is the scale of this problem. If a child is being abused, that has to be stopped. Now, there are four categories of child abuse under UK law. There's uh, physical, sexual, emotional, and neglect. But what's not clear is how you apply those categories to cross-cultural issues. So, for example, an African person might have a practice that they think is part of their tradition, that we would consider in the UK constitutes actual child abuse, and that is where the problem arises. Recently, an eight-year-old girl was starved and tortured in London. Child B, as she was known during the court case, was denied food and water for three days. But it didn't end there. Each one of these numbers represents an injury 43 in total. She was cut, kicked, repeatedly whipped with a belt. She had chili peppers rubbed in her eyes. At one point, she was put in a laundry bag and her abusers threatened to drown her. Perhaps most shocking of all, this abuse was carried out by devout Christians from her own family. The motive, it emerged, was to drive out 
the Kindoki spirit. The story was given blanket coverage in the tabloid press. Hoskins was an expert witness in the Child B case. He feels that despite the press attention, the full story was never explained. In the name of Jesus, so he's revisiting the church where Child B's family used to worship. You shall call his name Jesus. Child B's mother and aunt became convinced that this little girl had been possessed by Kindoki. The judge called it torture and gave a maximum sentence out on the two women involved. Christians worshipping here whilst little girls tied up in a laundry bag back at the house. She was found on the steps of her house a week after the abuse really kicked off, shivering, totally undernourished and eaten and drunk, because that was part of the idea of the deliverance from this kindoki. Police had no idea what on earth this was all about. What is this kindoki? What's this, this witchcraft, they said. So they called me in and asked me uh, to help them with the investigation. Hoskins argues it is the practice of deliverance that is central to an understanding of these child abuse cases. Deliverance means setting a person free from the kindoki that's inside them. It means casting that kindoki actually out of their body so that it's forcibly removed from them and hopefully never comes back. And it can be almost instantaneous. But more often than not, it's a process that involves the pastor's help. That may be through prayer, through fasting the child, and sometimes through actual physical contact. And the border that gets crossed there very easily is into abuse. This is the church where Child B's family worshipped, now in a new location. All over the UK, new African evangelical churches are flourishing. Today, over half of all churchgoers in the UK have their origins in Africa. The church in Africa has grown and spread over the past 100 years, but has really taken off in the last 10 to 20 years. They've reformed and reshaped Christianity in their own culture and context. An African scholar once said of Africans that for them religion is a way of life, and I think that's very true. There isn't that same distinction that we have in the West between religion and everyday life. For most Africans, everyday life is religious. Most Congolese pastors are regarded as leaders of their community. Many of the new churches in Britain are looked to for support and guidance by people trying to make their way in unfamiliar circumstances. This worldwide ministry is called Combat Spirituel, Spiritual Warfare. It's run by Elizabeth and Joseph Olangi, known by their worshippers as Mama and Papa. They almost never speak to journalists, and they're distrustful of the media. They, too, are filming this interview. Like most Congolese, they continue to believe in the existence of Kindoki and the need to fight it through a practice called deliverance, a form of exorcism which, at its most benign, is conducted by prayer alone. If it's necessary to have deliverance, is it a spiritual one? Yes, spiritual. Our fight is not physical. We pray, we, we, we fight on a spiritual level. Striking them to deliver them? Never. Never in a deliverance. Six months ago, there was a problem in Combat Spirituel. Some people practically tortured a child during deliverance. Not here in the church, but in their own home. It was in all the newspapers. It was pretty negative stuff. Do you have anything to say on the matter? 
We have not got the capacity to know what every individual does in their home. Our teachings are public. Public. Never in secret. You know, open to everyone. One of the people who listened to the teachings of Combat Spirituel was Sita Kasanga. She is one of the women convicted of abuse in the Child B case who regularly worshipped at Combat Spirituel. Hoskins met her in prison, the first time she has spoken since her conviction. This is what she told him of her relationship with the church. So, Mummy Sita. I wonder if that could be her, Sita, the aunt. I don't think this woman spent time here at Combat Spiritual. She did not even attend the classes. If she had, she would have known that we don't give prophecies. She did not master the teachings of our church. The proof is that she even left the church. For us, everything is love. She didn't understand a thing. She already had hatred in her heart. Kisanga recorded in her diary that she underwent a 21-day religious fast. After a fortnight, she wrote about her concerns that child B was possessed. Her diary also records a number of sermons about the dangers of spirit possession, mainly preached by the head of the London branch of Combat Spirituel, Pastor Raff. Three people were convicted of abuse in the child B case and jailed. Some Congolese church leaders acknowledge that the religious and cultural belief in witchcraft has, in some cases, led to child abuse. Among these pastors, the issue is raising considerable concern. We have to deal with this according, according to the law and according to the Bible without doing any harm to the adults or to the children. It's been proved in the Bible someone can be possessed by uh, demon spirit. That's uh, what I can say for the first person. We do believe in our culture there is a witch, and in the Bible we can prove as well there is a witch people. Sometimes people, they are called children, they are witch, but they are not a witch. It does happen, and we end up abuse the children, and we want to stop that as well. After Hoskins had been interviewed on television during the Child B trials, he was approached by a Congolese man. 
He said he was very concerned about the safety of children in some Congolese Christian communities. He believes the churches are part of the problem and agreed to go undercover to investigate. We've called him Claude. People are afraid of the pastor because the pastor are considered like small gods yeah. within the community. The pastor are using that to get power over people. If a pastor can be found that he's got that power to manipulate Kindoki, people will be following him. He will get more people in his church. Children have been victim of exorcism, and I think that's my moral responsibility to help sort this problem out. Claude is going to find a video which he believes will demonstrate just how damaging accusations of Kindoki possession can be, not just for the child, but also for parents. <laughs> This video was made by Pastor Moria, a Congolese pastor in control of the Faith and Victory Church in London. Pastor Moria denounced this woman as a witch. At the time of the recording, she was in a psychiatric hospital. Pastor Moria is heard encouraging her to name a list of people possessed with Kindoki. Claude has located some of the women denounced as witches in the video. They say their lives have been devastated. How could he show me on the video? He even sent the tape to my hometown. I've been getting phone calls from people saying to me, oh, we hear you've got witchcraft. People tell me that I've become extremely nervous. I've lost my confidence with other people now. I'm always stressed. Sometimes when I go to sleep, I suddenly wake up and find myself crying out. So I've gone through hell. When I saw the cassette, I went to the police. Until today, I've not heard one single thing. The women are going to confront the pastor face to face. They say it's the only way to put the issue behind them and move on with their lives. We asked Pastor Moria for an interview, but the request was not taken up. So Claude meets him in private, equipped with a hidden camera. The pastor claims to have witnessed supernatural events. This woman's child was also accused of having Kindoki. The effects have been devastating. If I die, I know my child will go through hell. <laughs> if I die, my child has had it. She will go through such suffering. I want to bring up my child. If someone else bringing her up, they will annihilate her because of the kandoki she's been accused of. <laughs> Unlike this woman, some Congolese parents do believe their own children are genuinely infected with Kindoki. And unlike the case of Child B, where a cure was attempted in the UK, some are sending their children back to the Congo to receive exorcisms. Sita Kisanga, the woman convicted of child abuse, talked about this to Hoskins. <laughs> Thank you.
the possibility that some people are sending their children to be exorcised in Africa is raising real concern. Family members have asked Hoskins to find out what has happened to a number of children now thought to be in the Congo. Top of his list is a child called Londres, who grew up in North London, but is now reportedly in the Congolese capital, Kinshasa. All Hoskins has to go on is a name and an address. The Congo is the third largest country in Africa. For hundreds of years, it has known little but tragedy and exploitation. In 1997, the country descended into a civil war which has now killed nearly four million people. I've been coming back and forth to this country for 20 years, and each time I return, it seems as if the place has deteriorated further. As it gets worse, so new Christian churches seem to spring up all over the place. Hoskins is on the trail of the boy from London, looking for his home address. We don't know what's happened to Londres. I do know that some conditions for children here are just desperate. One a second, God. The address is in one of the most dangerous quarters of a very dangerous city. Here, even getting out of the car would be life-threatening. Uh, they're just saying we, we will get our equipment confiscated here. <laughs> they said they'll kill us. Charming. A nice welcome to this particular raid. So they're going to smash our windows in. To get that tension right on the surface, just turning up with the camera, it just really gets it going. They're saying something about foreigners um, and uh, that we're not helping the country. Why should we film it? OK, take care. We're going to send a Congolese colleague working for us to walk down that road and see if he can find the house. I hope he's all right. Hope, uh, they can't have seen him in the vehicle. I hope. OK, he's coming. Well, uh, he quickly looked at me and told me, well, uh, uh, there's no laundry living here. Really? Uh, I said, what about the boy between 7 and yeah. 10? I said, no, 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 here really? there are no boys. We are all adults. We've got potentially a missing child in this city. Could be absolutely anywhere at this point in time. So what was I was thinking would be an easiest, easy search for this child was suddenly uh, potentially a real problem. Here, exorcisms of children seem to be an everyday event carried out openly. These children are often put on a fast, given no food and even water for days at a time. Children's relatives pay significant sums of money to churches to have their children delivered. Exorcism is big business in the Congo, and with wealth comes power, an important commodity here. In London, much of what happens here would be illegal. This is the world which Londres may have entered.
the streets of Kinshasa are filled with children living rough. Many are here not just because of poverty and neglect, but because of Kindoki. A recent Save the Children report said that of the 50,000 children living on the streets of Kinshasa, 70% are there as a direct result of witchcraft accusations. Many people are so poverty-stricken they are unable to support their families. There is evidence that spirit possession is being used as a justification for pushing children out of the home and onto the streets. Hoskins is being helped by Remy Mafu in his search for laundries. Remy runs a local charity caring for street children, most of whom have been accused of kindoki. Just the word kindoki seems to provoke controversy. Passers-by overhear the conversation and join in. One of the girls has agreed to tell her story, but only from the safety of a nearby refuge for street children. When we went to church, I fasted fully for three days. On the third night, they said I needed deliverance. The pastor asked me if I have kindoki. I replied, I don't have kindoki. I don't even know what kindoki is. They said I needed deliverance. They started a fire and carried me over to it. They grabbed my arms and legs and held me over the fire. If you cried out, it meant you had kindoki. It was so hot that I screamed out. They said that this meant I had kindoki. They took chili peppers, made a paste, and rubbed it in my eyes. Didn't that hurt? It was agony. I cried. They said my kindoki was gone and I could go home. Then my uncle hit me and beat me. He threw me out on the street. What do they do? They have destroyed my life. Hoskins suspects that this epidemic of cruelty is a modern phenomenon, a corruption of the traditional religions of the Congo. To find out, he is travelling to the small village of Batengi to meet some of the rural healers who represent the pre-Christian beliefs of the country. I just asked Zazi how long it's going to take and he said it'll take <laughs> about um, six or seven hours. Ooh. Chatting Mindele, Mindele, which means a white person. I haven't seen a white person around this, these parts for a couple of years, according to Nzazi. Twelve hours later, Hoskins finally meets the village chief. He disapproves deeply of the practices of many of the urban evangelical churches. In days gone by, only old people were accused of kindoki. These new churches that are accusing lots of children of having kindoki are being deceptive. It has become a kind of racket. They're only in it for profit. They're getting people to abandon their children for money. Putting chili peppers in children's eyes for deliverance is, is just corrupt. So what you're saying is those accusing children of kindoki are lying. Liars! Liars! 
It's because the country is on its knees. Since the churches are only in it for the money, people should stop believing them. In the village, the Ngangas, or traditional healers, are called upon to drive out the Kindoki spirit. First, they summon up the power of their own ancestral spirits. We're just talking about the, the role of the spirits. People in Europe who think that, the, that when somebody dies, that's it, in their opinion, are wrong. When somebody dies, their spirit remains, and you have to keep talking to that person. And especially for somebody like your grandfather or somebody important, that person remains, continues to teach you. You must preserve the customs of the village and the way of the family. And uh, it's all part of the idea of the extended family, the spirit world that goes out beyond the grave, what uh, someone once called famously the living dead, and they live beyond the grave and communicate with, uh, with people. So uh, he, he talks to his grandfather all the time. Can you explain to me what you do? If uh, someone comes to me with an illness, whether it's kindoki, whether it's sickness, or whether it's jealousy, my job is to heal. None of this is about kindoki. The focus of our work is healing. <laughs> One of the Ngangas explains the difference between the local methods of dealing with witchcraft and the modern Christian way. Mm. This is the traditional way, this is the way it's been taught for centuries, not the way of the new pastors. If you're being troubled by Kindoki, you go to uh, somebody like this Nganga, he's a diviner, first of all, he'll divine that the reason that you've got the, tr the troubles you've got is Kindoki. But then what he does is he goes and gets traditional medicine, just bar bits of trees, uh, plant material, mixes up a medicine, you just simply take that for a few days and the, and the kindoki won't trouble you anymore. There's no deliverance, there's no harming of a person. So the kindoki in that circumstance is just troubling you. It's not that you're possessed by it. A very different method than what's going on at the moment in the new churches. The perception of kindoki has changed with the arrival of evangelical Christianity in the Congo. Until then, there was no exorcism or exclusion of people believed to be possessed. But now it's very different, especially in the big cities. Back in Kinshasa, Hoskins has begun visiting a number of churches, looking for a lead in his search for Londres, the boy from London. But it's a needle in a haystack. There are hundreds of new Christian churches springing up every year. One of the largest is Combat Spirituel, the church linked to the Child B case in London. 50,000 people turn out for their Sunday service. It's one of the most influential churches in the country. And it's a church which is rich and well organized. It even owns its own school and hospital. It's a very strange thing that Christians here have often immense joy, but at the same time they're dealing with everyday suffering. and uh, a lot of them deal with suffering by finding joy in God. In a country with so much suffering, this church offers an attractive message. Through spiritual combat, any hardship can be overcome. But there's a paradox. Some of the churches that claim to offer relief from hardship may instead be causing it. Many of the people living in this graveyard have been accused of having kindoki. Remy, the charity worker helping Hoskins, is well known here. Papa, 
Olobini ni pona makambo itali kindo kia na yabana. Ngamu una una faze. Ngamu una una faze. Don faze mo kwa moni boali na kati ya bakini. Aebi kosekans o ya mo kwa mo kwa nenga zo sufri na kati ya bakini. Ngana aebi. One of the children has privately told Remy that a boy speaking English has been living rough in a nearby quarter. It's a notoriously violent neighborhood. When Hoskins and Remy arrive to try and find out more, initial hostility quickly turns to violence. They narrowly escape a beating. It's become too dangerous to continue searching for laundress on the streets. But Hoskins has discovered that there are churches here which have been granted government licenses to house abandoned children accused of possession by Kindoki. It's a slim chance, but worth trying. Bernard Njunga is a welfare officer at the Ministry of Social Affairs. He is accompanying Hoskins to a church on the outskirts of the city. All, all these children are staying at the moment in that room that we've just come from. But bino nyonso bazala bazala kina kindoki. Bino nyonso bazala kina kindoki. They come here, they get deliverance after being fasted for three days of food and water. And then they're held here until uh, somebody who hopefully cares for them pays money to the, to the women for their release. Uh, so one of them's been here for two months. Mama, isn't this basically a prison? No, no, it's not a prison. But it is a type of prison. No, it's a place for helping children. We don't want children spoiled, so we lock them up here. OK, just been chatting to uh, Mama Elise, who is uh, responsible for, uh, inverted commas, welcoming the children into the uh, church area. And then she's the one that handles all the monetary side of things. She decides how much each child has to pay to be uh, <clears throat> let go from here. But it seems this is just the tip of the iceberg. Later, Hoskins' search for laundress leads him to another church with a government license, also on the edge of Kinshasa. <laughs> On the other side of the church, a ceremony is underway. It's intended to cleanse the child's soul and involves squeezing salt water and antibiotics into the eyes. The children are then made to drink pigeon blood. 
There is a huge humanitarian disaster taking place in this country and people in the West have got to know about it. And however tough it is to film, and it is, it's got to be done. I want people to see what's going on here and to help. We're talking about tens and thousands of children who are either being abused or who are on the streets. And that is just a mind-blowing disaster taking place. I don't know what to think about what I've just seen. Um, it's absolutely extraordinary. A mixture of anger and sadness, but I'm actually I'm so shocked that I can't even express it. This is just a state of uh, catastrophic chaos that's taking place, and children are the main victims of this. And they, they seem so willing to want to go forward for it. That little girl put her hand out, wanting it, actually wanting to have that done to her. This is, this is child abuse full on. We've, we've obviously seen emotional child abuse, seen getting close to physical child abuse. This is full on physical child abuse. <clears throat> this guy could be in prison for this in Britain. Um, He's done this operation on over two and a half thousand children in the last year, and uh, all in the name of Christianity. <coughs> After some tugging and pulling, the pastor produces a piece of meat, supposedly from inside the girl's stomach. He claims that she is now cured. <laughs> The way you remove evil spirits surely harms children. No, no, it doesn't harm them. But cutting them with a razor surely harms them. No, the razor doesn't go deep. Besides, I'm in the spiritual realm. I seal the wound with my special paste. Why do you stamp on the children? The evil is locked deep within the stomach. So... I stamp, I stamp, stamp. As I stamp on them, my leg shakes. Then I draw out the kindoki. I don't want to be seen as an angry white man telling Congolese people how they should live their lives. But this is a serious, very real issue. You know, he, there are people here who are doing the most appalling things. Solange Gonda is the ambassador for children in the Congo. She is spokesperson for the government, appointed directly by President Kabila. She has an unenviable task. I'm begging everybody to talk to the kids, go out, talk to the Congolese kids in the society, see what, what is happening to them. We need to protect them. They don't deserve this thing, you know. A lot of those kids, the first time they will hear about the word Kindoki is when they be accused. Could you imagine a preacher standing up and start slapping and beating up a kid in a church and everybody thinks it's normal? Yeah. It's not normal for me. I've seen, for example, a pastor uh, cutting a child with, with a razor blade um, and doing other things in order to deliver that child. If people keep on giving those church the right to be, they're going to abuse kids. I do believe in religion. I do respect everybody's religion. 
but I won't. I will not stand and let people abuse kids in the name of God. Solange faces an uphill struggle. Although she has reported on the scale of the crisis, she appears to have only token support from the government, and little has changed since her appointment. There's still no news about Londres, the boy from London. Hoskins has decided to make one last attempt, returning to the house of the relative, the address he had been given in London. We're going to Londres's uncle's house. We don't think he's there. Uh, and they're denying all knowledge of him, but I want to I want to hear that myself from them. Uh, and then it's going to be a question of looking for him. Because the family apparently do not want to know they're playing very tough. We've got to um, put material here in order to block the sight of the camera because uh, last time we came down this avenue they threatened to uh, stone us, smash the windows, uh, and well actually and nearly kill us. This time the lead pays off. After some pressure, Londres's uncle admits that the boy has been there and adds that he has already been put through deliverance. What's the like deliverance? Deliverance? They arrive at a run-down neighborhood on the outskirts of Kinshasa. There's no sign of Londres, but his aunt appears and is prepared to talk. Then, just as Hoskins is about to leave, he hears a child's voice behind him. He is speaking English. Excuse me, who are you? It is Londres. At last, Hoskins has found the boy he's been searching for. He first asks him why he's in Kinshasa. My mum told me I'm going to Switzerland. Switzerland yeah. When I was going on the aeroplane, I saw in the aeroplane the road Kinshasa. I was crying. In London, my mom was always teasing me, oh, you're going to go back to Kinshasa. You're not going to eat no more. A day after, we start fasting, me with my mom. I was angry. I was smashing stuff, shouting, swearing. How long were you there? Two months. And how often did they make you fast? Every other week. Every other week. How long did they fast you for at a time? Seven days. Have you spoken to your mother since then much? She kept saying to me, oh, you have to get your witchcraft out. And she was threatening me. She said, I can do a 100 years in Kinshasa. Sometimes I think about London a lot. Would you like to be back there? Yeah. What we've got here is a British child who has been sent back to the Congo for exorcism and has, as a result, gone through incredible trauma, uh, uprooted from his home. And this is absolute concrete proof of the direct link now from Britain to the Congo in this issue. What is Combat Spirituel's response to Londres' claim that he was made to fast for a week by the church. We at Combat Spiritual do not force the children to fast. So are you saying that it's absolutely forbidden? No, 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 no. no. But if a child decides to fast and the Holy Spirit permits it, he can. He's free to do so. We don't impose fasting on young people. Is it reasonable to allow young children to choose not to eat or drink sometimes for days? Combat Spirituel thinks so. Londres claims that the ordeal he went through in the Congo 
had its roots in his mother's conversion to Christianity in London. When my mom started praying, they said I had kindoki. I never thought I had it. I didn't believe them. They say, yeah, I have kindoki, I kill this, I kill this, I eat this, I eat this, I do this. Had she said anything about kindoki before she started going to church? Mm -mm. Did you have any sense that what was being done to you was wrong? Yeah. How did that make you feel? Angry. I was supposed to get a British passport this year. Back in London, where Londres's story began. I'm on my way to see the mother of the boy who I found in Kinshasa. I need to get from her some sort of uh, response as to why she sent her son back to Kinshasa. I know from him and from the rest of the family why it happened, but I want to, I want to hear her side of the story. When the boy's mother rang up, she didn't want to meet me anywhere, but I finally got her to agree to meet me in a cafe. I didn't send him back because of Kondoki or the church. I returned him there to be educated. Social services wanted to place him in care, but I said no. I wanted to send him back to our homeland so he learned some respect. We parents in Africa, we have our own methods of education. We don't have social services. We, we don't have police child protection like here. But when you returned him there, the church became involved and said he has Kindoki. Who said he had Kindoki? The church, your mother, your father, your uncle. They said he has Kindoki? Yeah, absolutely. I heard it from your own mother. I know nothing about it. Well, how can you not know? Aren't you in touch? I do call them, but I know nothing about it. Your mother says he still needs deliverance. No, no, that's not right. Well, she says he's still got Kindoki. That's what she told me. You see, King Sasha people aren't very bright. They just say whatever pops into their heads. Despite his mother's denial, four family members in Kinshasa claimed that Londres was indeed sent back to receive deliverance. Evidence of a link between a belief in witchcraft in African communities and child abuse has raised real concern in Britain. In the wake of the Child B trial, the Metropolitan Police have set up a special unit, Project Violet, specifically to investigate these cases, currently over 30. Project Violet is around building education and understanding and awareness with communities, including pastors and churches, and, and building that understanding so that so that we un, you know there is a mutual understanding of the issues, and then by that way we can prevent child abuse happening in the future. And I think that's the really key thing, and I think that's where the role is really for the police to work in conjunction with other agencies and with the communities to come to a better understanding of what's acceptable and what isn't. But what if what if belief sometimes in some cases belief syst systematic belief is the trigger for abuse? Where we see criminal issues, we will deal with them. I mean, that's clear. You know, child abuse is child abuse, and we will not tolerate it. Many Africans in the UK feel that too little is being done to address such a serious issue. Community leaders argue that the churches themselves and local and national government should be taking far more vigorous action if children and vulnerable adults are to be safeguarded. You have uh, the NHS, you have uh, the child protection agencies, social services, but... When there is a problem with the child at home, they go to church. Mm -hmm. So why now is the system, the police, the, the, the social services are not going to church to see what is going there? Most of the children who are um, uh, accused of witchcraft or possessed is coming from the churches. So the source is the churches. This is the Congolese community that has migrated to Europe. Mm -hmm. It is a community which is trapped between two cultures. The community is crying for help. There is so many children suffering in silence. So many people suffering in silence. Where are we going to be in 10 years if we are not going to stop this kind of uh, issue? Le femme et les enfants. Et la même Bible nous dit deux personnes seulement 
Some Congolese pastors are now aware of the problem and are vigorously preaching against the dangers of witchcraft accusations. But the grip that Kindoki has on the Congolese is such that some pastors are continuing to preach about Kindoki behind closed doors, despite public claims to the contrary. In the light of the Child B case, Hoskins wants to know from Pastor Raff, the head of the Combat Spiritual Church in London, why pastors are still preaching about the threat of witches to their congregations, including children. C'est pour dire, même l'enfant, moi je n'ai jamais délivré les enfants, j'ai des encadrés qui s'occupent des enfants. La responsabilité dans la vie, ils ont reçu qu'on a niveau à l'église. Dans le cas où il y a des parents, ils ont la responsabilité, il y a moi dans la vie, il y a les bottes dans la vie. Il y a des gens qui ont eu 10 minutes, la personne est coquille, que le Seigneur vous bénisse. Amen. Que Dieu vous bénisse. Ok. Every case of abuse of a child is a terrible thing, and one case is one case too many. The churches, it seems to me, have a responsibility here. Even if they're not culpable, they are responsible. They're responsible for what they teach. They're responsible for the impression that they give to believers, some of whom are very easily led, displaced peoples, people trying to make a home in a difficult environment, trying to make sense of what it means to be living as an African now in Britain. And they're vulnerable, and pastors have huge power over them. And they've got a responsibility, these pastors, and within the church as a whole, the leadership. And they have to make sure that their house is in order. Churches are now global. Ideas, like people, travel freely and fast. Britain is now experiencing the consequences of some of the dark and damaging beliefs that have been born in the most desperate war-torn corners of Africa. Unless churches reject the idea of witchcraft as incompatible with modern Christianity, unless they campaign actively against violent exorcism, there is every chance that cases like Child B are going to happen again. <laughs>